ever had the feeling that the way geopolitical events unfold just don't seem to quite stack up? That it isn't an organic process? You know, the natural result of multiple competing forces playing out? Take the example of a country that is the fifth largest economy in the world, with the largest human population, vibrant democracy, crime statistics lower than most Western countries, and home to the oldest living civilization on planet Earth. An enviable track record by any measure. Of course, I'm talking about India, yet it does not have a seat at the world table, the United Nations Security Council. How does that make sense? Namaste and welcome. Let's invite our guest for today, Dr. Ankit Shah, who is a geoeconomics expert with an uncanny knack of connecting the dots and has quite a few things to say about all of this. He's also a fellow chartered accountant, previously an academic at IIM Ahmedabad, but most fascinating, I think, is his work on developing a Sanatan economics model, which is neither capitalism nor communism, two failed economic theories. So it'll be fascinating to explore what that means. But that's a bit later on, because first, we need to set some context. Dr. Shah, welcome. Great to have you. Namaskar. Namaskar, Navita ji. It's a pleasure to Thank you. be here. Um, Dr. Shah, we can understand that world events don't just happen. There are vested interests, unseen hands that trigger actions, which then play out to give us the observed version of history. But what we don't see are the hidden motivations of powers and their statecraft the puppeteers, if you like. Now, one of your fields of study is the role of global reserve currencies and the power they wield to shape geopolitical events. Can you give us some background and explain how the US dollar came to be the world's number one reserve currency? And why is this so important that certain interests will literally create wars to maintain this position? So it's, it's a very interesting topic for the viewers to understand how the backend geopolitics function uh, and how the, the role of currency has a major portion in defining how geopolitics functions. Uh, and the world reserve currency status is certainly one of the most uh, exorbitant privilege a country can have. And as we all know that the baton of leadership went from United Kingdom to the other side of the Atlantic, to the United States. Uh, and when this baton of leadership went to the other side, the major chunk of power that emanates is, is the reserve currency status. So how was pound actually replaced by the US dollar is the question as the reserve currency of the world. Now, Britain had this privilege of political power over a, a major chunk of the world, uh, the swaths of world as it had colonies world over. United States did not have this privilege. So this transition of a reserve currency from, from one reserve currency to another world reserve currency is a very simple process. It is simple physical accumulation of gold and silver as precious metals. So first you need to accumulate physical gold and silver and then you can impose your conditions uh, with which, you know, the rest of the world can function and conduct international trade. So United States, uh, in a very calculated manner, supplied war supplies for the Second World War to the European countries. And in exchange of war supplies, it collected physical gold. Once all the physical gold was collected by United States with the Bretton Woods Agreement after the Second World War, United States dollar was imposed as the new reserve currency of the world. This is how the United States dollar replaced the British pound as the new reserve currency. Now, it is fascinating to know, Navitaji, uh, that uh, both Britain and US, both these countries, when, when they had this, you know, Brit US still has this global power status. So during this term of being the global power status, both these countries functioned with a reserve currency, which is a single country reserve currency for the world. This is something which is very important to note. Now to, now to exercise this kind of an influence that a single country's currency is going to be the reserve currency of the world, you need not just a too much of diplomatic heft, 
but also military intervention as well. Not just a military intervention, you also require support of international bodies, which is why all the post Second World War international busy bodies that you see, be it United Nations, be it a World Bank, be it the IMF, be it the World, uh, World Trade Organization, all of these international bodies, they function on a simple template of a unipolar dollar world. They actually empower and equip United States to continue that hegemony. After the Second World War, as United States reserve currency uh, became the dollar, became the new reserve currency for the world, uh, it is very interesting to see that the Cold War started with the USSR. Uh, the country start, again started questioning the trust factor in the paper currency. And that is the exact point in time United States came up with a, with a new idea. It added the words, in God we trust. These were the words added to the currency. Now, uh, the idea here was twofold. One, to bring back the trust of the people on the currency. Second, to counter the communist USSR because communists do not believe in religions. They say religion is the opium for the masses. So they use this particular words in God we trust to counter USSR as well with this terminology. So up until 1971, we had a reserve currency which was pegged to a gold standard. Because prior to pound, what we had in the world was, uh, you know, a distributed system of precious metal coins, gold and silver coins. So in order to keep the trust of the people, you had the kings and queens faces minted on the coins and the currencies. Similarly, this US dollar also had to be pegged to a gold standard. So a particular quantity ounce of gold has to correspond to the new currency notes that you print. So this went on till 1971. So before 1971, as this Vietnam war was going on, that was the point in time when the rest of the world, because that the war was stretching so long, the rest of the world again started losing faith in the US dollar and the US economy. So that is the point in time when the world said, you know, take back the dollar and give physical gold back to us. So that was a point in time President Nixon came out with this idea. Let's unhook the dollar from the gold standard. So 15th August 1971 is the date President Nixon selected for unhooking the dollar from the gold standard. Now there is very interesting, uh, uh, you know, back end story for this. Because just prior to 15th August 1971, few weeks prior, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was voted as one of the most popular leader in the non-communist countries uh, by a Gallup poll. And from the declassified information that we have right now, we know that Henry Kissinger and uh, President Nixon, the kind of language they used for the Indian Prime Minister and the Indian administration. So uh, it pretty much makes sense why they selected 15th August 1971 to unpack the dollar from the gold standard. So it's certainly out of too much love for India. So, <laughs> right. So, so that was the day. Wh why did they dislike Indira Gandhi and India at that point? They believed that we were a, a too much of communist in our governance style. And, and frankly, that was a correct assessment in terms of the kind of license Raj and the kind of public sector orientation that we right. had in our economy up until 1991 reforms. Mm -hmm. So that was a correct assessment. Um, so and, and we already always were aligned in terms of defense with the Soviet Union, which everyone knows about. So uh, on that day, 15th August 1971, the world went to a completely new economic order where the currencies are now no more pegged to a gold standard, which means all the currencies of the world became what we call as the fiat currency backed by absolutely nothing. 
So now the central banks of the world are free to print based on their own prudence as much currency notes they want. Obviously, there are repercussions for printing endlessly. But backed by nothing is the world that we are right now till date. All the currencies are backed by nothing. All the currencies are right now the fiat currencies. Now began a cycle of concrete dollarization of the world. So Henry Kissinger goes to Saudi Arabia, 1973. Uh, he offers an oil for security program to Saudi Arabia, whereby United States ensures the security of the Gulf. And in exchange for that, entire OPEC crude oil was to be sold compulsory in US dollar. Now, this gave birth to a concept called petrodollar. Now, because the savings of the world is in US dollar and the Gulf has a chunk of petrodollar as revenues, all these have to be recycled back and invested in the US treasuries and the US dollar. Now, this became a kind of a dot-com bubble by late 1990s in the US economy. So all the Western sectors and particularly the IT sector was born out of this fiat reserve currency dollar. Uh, the audience needs to know this, note this, that the IT sector and the services sector both were born in this world out of this fiat reserve currency dollar. Now, the entire chunk of inflated value went and set into the dot com. Now, we know that there were individual attempts to de dollarize, one by Saddam Hussein of Iraq and second by Colonel Gaddafi of Libya. Both of them individually tried to de dollarize, and we know what the fate was. But the first serious attempt of de dollarization came from allies and it came from European Union. So European Union came up with a currency called Euro. So if Germany and UK wants to trade with each other, they would trade in Euro and not the US dollar. Germany and France wants to trade with each other, they will use Euro. So this was the first serious challenge to the US dollar. And the euro was able to snatch about 20% of the reserve currency status of the dollar. Furious with this, United States uh, dragged the NATO to a Yugoslavia conflict and brought the valuations of euro down. By this time, uh, the European Union said that we are no more going to park our savings in the US Treasury and the US dollar. So now, furious with that, United States brought China in the World Trade Organization, distributed all the benefits of the World Trade Organization membership to China. And then we know the journey, how China became the manufacturing giant and the factory that it has become of the world today. That's really interesting right. that because the European Union challenged the US dollar, we ended up having a Yugoslav war, which balkanized the country. Um, these policies to bring China into the World Trade Organization has completely changed the power structure of the world, which I'm sure the US probably at that time had not envisaged. It's a, it's sort of a, a side effect that, you know, they, they probably didn't expect to happen. And um, these are, it's, as you said, the, the sort of the machinations behind the scene really set a very different trajectory of events that anybody could have predicted at that time. Correct. So uh, as soon as European Union withdrew uh, uh, from uh, parking the savings, uh, it was like a panic attack for the U.S. economy mm -hmm. because, you know, a chunk of uh, European countries, uh, you know, withdrawing from valuations from their sector. So uh, hurriedly, they had to uh, cook up something. So they passed an act called Graham Lilly Act. So what did the Graham Lilly Act do? It repealed the requirements of the Glass-Steagall Act 
the Glass-Steagall requirements was uh, that the public deposit would be kept separate from investment banking. That was a requirement in the U.S. economy. So that was repealed and this Graham-Lilly Act mixed up the investment banking with the commercial banking. So now what was happening was, uh, as soon as an American deposits an amount in the account, uh, the bank has a legal right to sweep that amount into a separate account and then play speculative trade with it in all the sectors of the economy. So this is how, because the European Union came up with this euro currency, uh, US had to do this kind of jugard in the internal economy to mix the public deposit money with the reserve currency bubble to support the IT sector at that point in time. Yes, but yes, since... I think because as you said, the Glass-Steagall Act, which was in 1933, if I'm not wrong, separated the commercial banking with investment banking because to because there was moral hazard in that structure. And yet later on, they repealed it. But that moral hazard was still there. Nothing changed. It was just this desire yeah. to maintain the reserve currency status, which made them make a completely different political decision, um, which is completely contrary to what they had said before. Yep. So now what happened, as soon as the European Union withdrew their savings uh, and, and the cycle of investments in the US Treasury, the dot-com got burst and the IT sector lost valuations of about 78% by October 2002. So this was the first ever de-dollarization that the world has seen. And right now what is going on is the final de-dollarization, which is why uh, I am not surprised the way IT sector is laying off people. Because uh, my, my uh, prediction is that by the end of this year, U.S. stocks, bonds and derivatives will lose another 15 to 35 percent valuations and the IT sector is going to just come down. That's what's going to happen because it was born out of this reserve currency status. Uh, so it's, it's going to go with it. Right. OK, so we'll continue uh, what happened yes, next. Please. So once uh, the Chinese now promised that instead of European Union, it's we who are going to take the U.S. Treasury. So uh, the Chinese invested in the U.S. Treasury. So at this point in time, as we all know, China and Japan together holds more than 50 percent of the U.S. Treasury. Um, China became the manufacturing giant that we all know. 2008 crisis comes. And because this Graham Lilly Act uh, mixed this public deposits with the you know investment banking nobody went to jail because it was legal nobody went to jail in the 2008 crisis it was all legal right so after the 2008 crisis as we all know that the western economies have the same solution to every economic problem which is turning on the printers so united states again starts printing dollars from 2009 this time, this entire printing cost becomes brutal inflation to the rest of the world and particularly the Middle East. And the Middle East faces what we call as the Arab Spring because of the food inflation. Several governments fall down. This is the first time the Gulf countries realize uh, the heavy cost that they are paying to continue the U.S. dollar. Not just that, they realize that they already lost about 50% of their crude oil wealth in radicalizing the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East just for the sake of keeping the U.S. dollar going. Because all these conflicts, I've you know narrated in my forthcoming book, on geopolitics, there's a chapter called the dollar of war, where I say uh, I've termed it as a two buckets theory, where the healthy nation is told that, see, your neighbor is a rogue country. Uh, he needs to be sanctioned, which is why the healthy country has to continue with the U.S. dollar. 
so you know several there are many geopolitics experts who who are baffled why united states sanctions which are uh, countries which is actually counterproductive to us but they do not realize that in this two buckets theory one bucket has to be sanctioned so that other bucket can continue with the us dollar otherwise the healthy country will not continue with the us dollar right so that's what i call as the two bucket theory so uh, the united states distributes dollars and arms to one bucket and the other bucket is sanctioned that is how the us dollar continued for the last 40 50 years so after 2011 as the gulf got this realization that not just they have lost 50% of their crude oil wealth in radicalizing just for the sake of supporting the dollar uh, the savings that they are making after selling the crude oil is in a fiat dollar which is backed by nothing which is which has already losing the purchasing power like crazy so if you start from 1913 federal reserve today about 98 to 99% of the purchasing power of the dollar is gone so who will store their excess savings in a currency which loses purchasing power like this it is not a good store of value now those countries which are purchasing and doing transactions in the us dollar they realize that the american lifestyle is actually being sponsored because they are transacting in us dollar because as many times the federal reserve prints the us dollar to distribute uh, the social benefits the entitlement benefits the income security the food stamps all the social benefits this passes on as a cost to the rest of the world because they transact in the us dollar so so all these transactions in the dollar they're kind of like creating a synthetic demand for the dollar which then enables the us to print and then shift all the dollars over mm. exactly so all all these social benefits are only possible because it is a reserve currency status otherwise this endless printing is not possible now a lot many of countries in asia who are seeking this western lifestyle and looking at that lifestyle as some you know a you know utopian goal to achieve they do not realize that your country does not have a reserve currency so your parent is not going to be taken care by the state with a medicaid mm. or a, or a retirement benefit or a social benefit or a 401k etc or an income security so they have no realization that actually it's going from our pockets the, the entire western lifestyle so uh, people don't know this um so now as the gulf countries realized this they started moving towards deradicalization uh and mbz of ua mohammed bin zayed was probably my reading is he was waiting since 10 15 years for some international support to come in to help him deradicalize the gulf and i think prime minister modi perfectly fit in that spot as he came in 2014 so uh, the gulf has seen the american style of uh, deradicalization bombers flying from the top uh, they have seen the mi- russian military style of taking to task and they have seen the chinese style of stealing organs from the uyghur muslim bodies so i think they safely selected indian yoga ayurveda and mandirs so <laughs> they purposely selected i think they they understood that this is a safer method so uh, you know they started using uh, the indian mandirs mm-hmm. yoga ayurveda and propagating it in the gulf all over the gulf uh, not just uae and saudi saudi is officially taking taken it into the curriculum so yes that's interesting because we the- see all these mandirs coming up in the middle east and it seems very strange given it's an islamic country and we know that you know it, it, traditionally the two cultures have gone head to head in the past and so what's driving this and now you explain that it's this attempt to de-radicalize the region and to but how does that get them away from dollar dependency so once this deradicalization happens they are they will be able to diversify their economy outside of the crude oil trade so once that society comes out from this traditional 
uh, misgivings or the kind of, uh, you know, a grooming that they have had, there will be a possibility of, you know, a, a, a broader acceptance of other sectors like tourism. So UAE, you see, uh, doing very well mm -hmm. with tourism. Whereas, you know, Saudi Arabia is still moving towards that because it's still a traditional uh, religious society. So uh, the MBS of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, is looking forward. He looks at MBZ as his mentor, which is exactly why he is also moving towards uh, modernizing the economy. So the Gulf took this stand that it is alliance with India is the only healthy and possible way forward not just to diversify the economy but also to de-radicalize the society and move into the future which is why they are connecting their roots back uh, to the indian subcontinent which they always had i mean they, they renamed a place as a hind city recently as you would have known uh, and many of the arab women carry that a word Hind as well in their names. So that also comes from that ancient historical ties with the Indian subcontinent, uh, the Silk Route and the trade ties that they had with the Indian subcontinent. So this is the entire, uh, which is why I say de-dollarization is equal to de-radicalization and de-dollarization is also going to be equal to de-missionarization because once this endless printing of euro and dollar will stop there will be no more free flow of supplies to the missionaries in the indian subcontinent even elsewhere so i believe in the in the new world where the brics plus is taking the world to uh, the pegged currency world there will not be any more scope of endlessly printing currencies because it will be hooked to a finite commodity like gold, silver, whatever the formula that they are making, right? So this will also be equal to de-missionarization and de-dollarization will also be equal to de-communism because the end of endless printing means the socialist freebies cannot be absurdly declared by the politicians anymore. I give you this free, I give you that free. That cannot happen because once the currency is pegged with a finite commodity, uh, you can no longer declare freebies like you will. Mm. There's a fiscal discipline to be maintained with a pegged currency. So Prime Minister Modi is taking the world in a new world where uh, it's not just de-radicalized, de-missionarized, but also de-communized. Mm. So... Uh, that's very where interesting. We are heading. Very and, interesting. So, tell us a bit more about how do these BRICS countries envision the process to work? You know, I think what they're Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and there are more countries that want to join. Just talk us through the process, what stage it's at, what sort of timeline we can expect, because it sounds like a very good idea. To it'll help create a more equitable, multipolar world you know, compared to the very unipolar world that we have at the moment. Yeah. So the momentum started from 2015. The leadership was taken by the Indian Prime Minister. He first started with a scheme called Gold Monetization Scheme because Indians are, are the highest private per capita gold holders in this world, which is why when all this happens, India will come out to be one of the uh, richest private per capita gold holders, as we, as we know. So first he tried to channelize the domestic gold to coffers, but as our civilizational wisdom goes, nobody is going to part with gold, as you know. So, uh, you know, uh, that scheme did not work so well, but some of the mandirs did channelize some portion of gold in this scheme. But after that, uh, India took the leadership. They said, we are no more going for any kind of a multilateral trade pacts with anybody. Any country who wants to trade with India, they have to come individually and we will do bilateral free trade agreements with each of these nations and we are going to discuss and negotiate with each of them. So the idea here was uh, that in a multilateral setting, dollar is a default. 
because there are 10, 15, 20 nations you are doing a pact with. So to come out of that, we, we came up with this idea of individual free trade agreements. And mind it, Russia and China has no clue what India is doing. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, when I look at the Western media, they blame Russia and China for de-dollarization all the time. So uh, they have no clue. It's India who's the leader. So uh, India came up with this idea. Uh, all the countries lined up. In fact, even China, Japan, Australia, all countries were forcing India to join RCEP. Mm -hmm. That was a Southeast Asia uh, tra trade alliance. India said, no, we are doing individual free trade. Simple. So it's, the idea is that once we go to the pegged currency world, it is very easy to flip individual free trade agreements outside dollar because you you cannot bargain with 15 20 nations together to flip out of dollar right so this was the idea so after that the indian government you know made moves to uh, reduce visa and mastercard and came up with rupee and upi which is now with 35 plus countries officially accepted as payment interface wow. so so India was going so fast with de-dollarization. As I said, Russia and China has no clue what's going on. So we today have the first mover advantage with de-dollarization at this point in time. Now, you have 35 plus nations which are already aligned, including EU countries uh, who accept these payments, right? This payment interfaces. Now, you have this done. The BRICS countries, are, BRICS countries are already central banks are accumulating physical gold and silver from the West. Uh, the West is passing on. I wonder why. You know, one of the reason uh, I say that it's going to happen is because some factions of the West is aligned with us. So certainly some faction is aligned. Otherwise, you won't have this physical deliveries of gold and silver like we had. So. Uh, all the BRICS plus nations, uh, central banks collecting physical gold. And since, you know, uh, United States and UK were making single country reserve currency, as I said at the start, BRICS plus is not making single country. It is going to be a basket of all the participant nations currencies. So a truly democratic currency where, you know, no single country is going to boss around. No single country is going to uh, threaten sanctions. No single country is going to weaponize uh, the payment systems. Uh, no single country is going to say, hey, I, I have frozen your reserves, right? So since it is a multi-country basket, BRICS Plus do not require this much gold as US and UK had. A tiny proportion of gold in the reserves is enough to flip the dollar out of its status. So this is the benefit of a multi-country democratic reserve currency that the BRICS plus countries are making. So, and I believe this August. This August. Uh, they, right, so quite soon. This August, this August in Africa summit, uh, they are going to discuss the currency format. I just got news uh, ticker uh, f a few minutes back before we started that South Africa is now listed, grey listed in FATM. Oh. So. Okay. <laughs> there will be counter moves, right? Yeah. Now, what what is, um, whilst the BRICS are all getting together and more and more countries seem to be wanting to join them, what's the US doing about this? I mean, isn't it, it's detrimental to the dollar. Do you think that there are, there, are there any advantages to them or, or is there something under the scene that could surprise us because you know they want to stop this effort uh, navita ji i mean i, I am uh, totally opposite to all the other experts i mean geoeconomics expert whatever they call mm -hmm. it uh, because they all are relying on us military to come and stop this thing and uh, even the investment biggies that i have talked in the west with all of them are hoping that no this this will take decades um, and I don't believe this because I believe that a big faction of the West is aligned on this. 
uh, which is why I, I can give you so many pointers. Uh, the the moment the moment U.S. exited from Afghanistan, a uh, few weeks from there, Saudi Arabia signed a defense cooperation with Russia. So, principally speaking, that very moment, the oil for security program got reversed. And nobody forced U.S. to take that decision to exit Afghanistan. It was U.S.'s own True. decision. Mm-hmm. Correct? Then United States is um, asking EU with this Ukraine mm-hmm. conflict, which I believe is a de-dollarization script, actually. But uh, U.S. forces EU to ban the import of Russian gold. Now, this is exactly what is needed for de-dollarization, that Russia accumulates gold. Once EU bans this import of Russian gold, US passes on gold to the Swiss refiners, Mm -hmm. and the Swiss refiners is passing on that gold to China. This is exactly what is needed for de-dollarization. So instead of countering, I see it's aligned with this decision. So, but how does that help uh, them? How does that help the US? It seems to be against well, the, the U- interests of the mighty dollar and the country. So uh, one thing we need to understand here that they have accumulated 31 trillions plus of debt mountain, mm-hmm. which is now, which they never actually intended to repay. But the fact is that the repayments are being claimed. So uh, it's, it is it is now at this point of history where the interest expense have crossed the defense spending. This is exactly the point where Britain lost its world power status. When the interest mm-hmm. expense crossed the defense spending. This is exactly where it's exact the point where the Dutch lost its status. The Spanish lost its status. So I'm not surprised that uh, U.S. is at that critical moment where they actually need a global reset so that, you know, they can bring back manufacturing home and, uh, you know, actually start working on economics because they did a big mistake of passing on the entire uh, manufacturing and supply chains to Asia. Now, Obviously, this was a lot of exploitation for the Chinese labor and the Asian resources, but uh, the result is out in front of you. Uh, China now can, you know, uh, dictate the terms because uh, it's the manufacturing uh, hub and the supplier of the world. So all why are the BRICS plus nations uh, attracted to join BRICS? Why have they made applications? Because China is inside. That's the factory of the world. Uh, and the Chinese have realized that they slogged for the West for four decades for the entire world in being the manufacturing giant that it became, but made only three trillions in profits. That is how dollar ruined them. Whereas United States printed 13 trillion plus in just the last three years and distributed to Americans for free in socialist freebies. So the Chinese have come to this realization that it ha- they became aged before being rich. That is the kind of exploitation dollar has had on them. So they are no more interested in uh, the dollar trade. So uh, just we have the news right now that Iraq and China are now shifting to yuan trade. So, so it's- and guess who? Mm-hmm. Guess who is supporting that trade? J.P. Morgan. <sighs> Interesting, very interesting. Now, what would happen to this conglomeration of countries, the BRICS? Like, if, for example, there are some geopolitical tensions between the member states, like, does that not affect trust and transparency? Would that have a negative impact on whatever this new BRICS currency is going to be? Very interesting question, because I get this question. Uh, so, trust. Now, if you ask anybody, the first question on challenging the dollar would be that who's going to trust? What is going to replace dollar? Right now, this is a confusion which the world has. Nobody ever trusted the dollar. 
the countries of the world trusted the endless printing capacity of the dollar the liquidity of the dollar the convertibility of the dollar was trusted mm-hmm. right so nobody trusted the american brains nobody trusted the american economy nobody trusted the american military or the government people trusted the federal reserve's capacity of endlessly printing so say tomorrow i am putting my savings in the us dollar i am assured that i will get my repayment because at the very least the federal reserve will print and give it right so the trust was this endless printing capacity because of the rc status of the dollar now coming back to your question what happens when you know if say india and china has an lse issue which is ongoing what 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 implication does that have to the brics currency uh, i believe no impact it will have and i'll tell you why because in the single country reserve currency format the world has to uh, follow the dictate of us in the multi currency format uh, nobody is going to be able to boss around which means that no amount of bilateral conflict is going to affect a multilateral currency i can give you an example poland right now is asking for second world war reparations from germany that has no impact on euro currency has it no right so tomorrow if germany and france goes for a war it will not have any impact on the euro currency mm-hmm. trade because it is a multilateral currency format if it was germany's currency then nobody can dare have a conflict with germany right but since this is a multilateral format no amount of bilateral conflict is going to uh, you know change equation or cause a problem right so a much more robust system of world governance and and very very democratic yes. it would be like a i believe it would be like a free entry and exit mm. okay so if a participant currency wants to go out they can go out uh, and the participant currencies also get to keep their national currencies which is a, another plus point oh another plus right. point of the system so within the country the, they would operate using a national currency but for yes, international exactly. trade they would use the brics currency brics right currency. which would and, and 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 when you go as a tourist to any of the brics nations again you can use the brics currency right. okay so, yeah okay sounds good now you mentioned um this great reset which we hear a lot about and one of the things that um tends to concern people is this whole introduction of cbdc's you know the central bank digital currencies which um is a bit concerning because you know they are a form of mass surveillance and even worse potentially a form of control so because they're programmable and if the government doesn't like what you're doing they can take money out of your account potentially and um, we saw an example with the canadian government when they froze the bank accounts of the truckers the um who were protesting against Justin. the vaccine mandates now is that something that could happen in india as well or or are the cultural values so strong that they would prevent such types of government overreach hmm. so so let me give some geopolitical background to this uh, cryptocurrency yes. thing so after the 2008 crisis united states particularly started pushing bitcoin officially because it was sensing that de-dollarization would be around the rounds because Uh, they are going to do endless printing which will have some uh, response coming in so they were looking at this private cryptocurrencies as a backdoor entry for the us dollar after de-dollarization that was the idea back then what has happened after 2015 is uh, most of the central bankers of asia and gulf whenever they were asked about private cryptocurrencies they had a very clear answer which is that it cannot be the legal tender of money usage 
This is a very clear statement, even from the Reserve Bank of India mm-hmm. governor, that this cannot be a legal tender of money usage. If you have a blockchain technology or whatever advanced technology that you're talking about, you can have all other use cases you want. We have no issue with that. But if you want a use case, which is a legal tender of money, that will not be allowed. Right. So this is a very clear stand with respect to the private cryptos. So once this stand was taken, United States decided to kill the private cryptos. And in order to kill the private cryptos, they they came up with this idea of competition with a CBDC. Now, uh, obviously, if one country is coming up with a CBDC, Uh, It has its own uh, benefits in terms of the speed of transaction, reduction in cost of transaction, etc., etc. So all the countries started working on their own CBDCs. Indian government also started working on a digital rupee uh, on the lines of digital yuan and digital dollar. So uh, you rightly pointed out that this is a fully controlled communist currency. Now, this is not a requirement for Asian country like India or Uh, you know, other big powers of the BRICS, but the West certainly needs this communist currency because uh, the amount of crisis that is coming forward with the fall of the fiat dollar, the only way out is that they will have to take everything in control. So the digital dollar is coming mid 2023, which is June, right? Uh, the LIBOR rate is also deadline for June in the US and the debt ceiling deadline is also June in the US. So it's all timed along with that. Uh, and I believe that only when they have full control of money that they, uh, they will be able to do the Ponzi work that they are supposed to do for the to coming out from the crisis. But uh, one major problem with this is the surveillance that you already talked about that they are going to trace everything where you spend how much you spend and tomorrow they can not just they have the information uh, but they can uh, curb individual users Uh, they can do anything Uh, one of the thing in terms of digital rupee which is clarified by the government here is that you are not going to get an interest income on it Uh, but i am worried about the negative interest rates in the West. What if tomorrow an American account has a salary deposit of 20,000 and because it's an electronic entry, they flip it to 18,000 applying the negative interest rates. Uh, It is very much feasible. Uh, And the kind of uh, uh, the economy trim, which the US requires once 180 nations pull out of the reserve currency valuations from all the sectors, they will require capital trimming. So this is very much possible, this kind of application of negative interest rates. Uh, wherein I have already predicted uh, 2025, a 60% cut to the salary levels of Americans, uh, a 35% cut on uh, the entitlement benefits and 25% cut on the defense budget. Because one, you imagine 180 nations pulling out from the valuations of the reserve currency. So all the sectors have to come down to the tiny real values that they are, which is capital trimming, by the way. So that's the that's where it is all heading to. In the Sounds West. like a very difficult time for the West. So what would be the impact? Now, how would India be affected by all of this? Uh, I believe that... Uh, India has always been like out of the planet in the sense that, uh, you know, we have we have 65 percent, 65 to 70 percent of domestic consumption. It really doesn't matter where the world lies, frankly speaking, because uh, the the demand is moving ahead of supply. (laughs) So, uh, you know, uh, when when people talk about this Adani FPO issue or the Indian stock markets, now what percentage of Indian economy is in the stock market? Massive economy is totally unorganized. There's there's a tiny proportion in the Indian stock of market organized sector. It really doesn't matter to the Indian economy at all because the consumption levels are robust. 65 to 70 percent on a domestic consumption, which is why Xi Jinping just, uh, you know, a few days back, 
he's talking about uh, uh, shoring up domestic consumption so that because he's going to empty the was uh, the Walmart and Costco racks so he wants all those products consumed somewhere mm-hmm. so so it's either going to be the ch- local chinese or the gulf there are only two options so this is all where it is heading towards but in terms of indian economy i believe uh, this is going to be india's century 100% because uh, you know even even in the brics format you just you just understand how much vulnerable even the big powers are other than india so xi jinping went to uh, riyadh for an arab summit for 3 days to find out that if i am going to decouple from the west what kind of commitment do i have from the gulf and to his shock he got a commitment of 30 billions 30 so xi jinping went back from saudi arabia with a lesson that nobody is going to trade with me if india is not kept in between which is why i am saying that the gift city in gujarat is going to be the mini world bank for de dollarization uh, an invest a fresh investment of 2.4 lakh crores uh, increasing the size to three times for the gift city uh, amdabad airport 10000 crore uh, 10000 crore for uh, three railway stations including one amdabad so uh, and shijay shankar brought about 50 countries to gujarat ambassadors uh, you know last navratri so i think the plans are very clear that this is going to be the mini world bank kind of a setup for de dollarization as a nodal agency which is why we have the new development bank of prix regional office in the gift city so and and, and a lot many of the us companies have already come and settled here so i oh. believe those are aligned as well so interesting times for india ahead then So very interesting. So talk to us now a little bit about Sanatan economics because I know you have a book coming out but um it sounds so fascinating that if you could just give us a bit of a preview that would be really wonderful. Yeah. So uh, the difference between you know uh, I what I would say is you know capitalism Adam Smith capitalism uh, has managed to give us 60% divorce rates. Uh, and karl marx communism has managed to give us 60% slave population with state control so which is exactly why uh, uh, and you know why this has happened is because both of them forgot to mention the word family in their economic theories now a kid can tell you uh, that every economic decision is a family decision it has the first impact the ripple effect of any economic decision is going to come to the family members so what i say capitalism and communism is is actually exporting the sacrifices among the family members outside of the family which is why it becomes brutal to anyone who comes to be the victim of both these theories because it goes outside the family members which is why capitalism and communism becomes brutal for uh, whoever comes to be the victim right now when we talk about family unit economics which is why i say I, i quote the example of nris because i've predicted that they are going to be beaten once this uh, fiat reserve currency falls because what is going to happen in the west is uh, th- there is going to be a high interest regime to curb the inflation and high interest rate regime means this financial institutions who have the habit of giving cheap and easy money to the uh, to the whites will no longer be able to give loans to the whites credits uh, credit no uh, credit card uh, extended limits to the whites and will only be able to give loans to the indians because the indians have the backing of uh, their strong family strong education and strong career it's only because the of the stability of the parents that the indians are able to complete their post graduation etc right which is why they have good career as well whereas the westerner people you know by the time the kid comes into graduation two three parents have already rotated right 
So, uh, because we believe in the life cycle of, you know, uh, taking care of the next generation and the previous generation. Uh, because of this wisdom, the NRIs have been able to be so successful mm-hmm. in there. But it's going to haunt back because these people are not going to like that you only the NRIs are taking getting the loans. So they are going to be chased once this fiat currency fiasco and the crisis events begin. I foresee that. I've already predicted riots in which states and year for America. So So you could uh, see a big influx of NRIs moving back to India then. Oh well the Prime Minister has already opened up the avenues Mm. for it. Uh, I, uh, one was a security scheme where uh, uh, the um, the foreign investments can be uh, registered with a resident Indian mm-hmm. name, and sex and second is a very recent one which is the UPI transfer of money. Right. So he's already opened up the avenues to start passing on whatever that you want to pass on, because understand one thing: this all the Western sectors are artificially inflated with the parking of savings of the rest of the world. So once these countries start withdrawing one by one, all these sectors are going to crash, mm-hmm. including housing sector, be it any Western asset, be it housing sector or whatever. So these valuations are going to come down to the real tiny values. And when the West starts to uh, manufacture home, that is the point in time the West will also realize that it is not just going to pollute its own country, but to even to think of standing a made in US product with an Asian made in Asia product, uh, the salary of the Americans will have to be cut 60% to make it affordable. Right. So that is where uh, that number of 60% has come. So across the board, you will have to cut down the salaries if any locally manufactured mm-hmm. product has to be consumed right locally right. so coming back to that uh, sanatan economics where you know when we talk about uh, social welfare mm-hmm. we have this dharmic concept of what we call as uh, atithi right atithi is someone you know uh, who can enter your house without giving you atithi he's not going to give you a date and time his stomach is empty you are going to give him food so such a country, such a society, a dharmic society where there is a, you know, a, a, a dharmic cap on your behavior, uh, you do not require a socialist welfare from the mm-hmm. state where the community is so, uh, you know, empowered in a fashion, right? Similarly, you see uh, our festivals. Now, Danteras is the only festival, this is the only civilization in the world which celebrates ethical profits as a community festival. So when we use those words Shubhlab on the day of Dhanteras, what we mean is that only ethical profits is allowed to enter my home. Similarly, if you look at the accounting books where we write Shri Sava on the Mm -hmm. top, Shri Sava means that uh, I'll take only 25% of cost as profit. I will not take more money than this from anyone. So this is the kind of a, a top-down control of dharma on profits, mm-hmm. on exploitation of the society. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, a Sanatan economics uh, model that we need to come about. Uh, you know, the modern uh, extreme capitalism can be curbed in this fashion. Whereas in the West, you see that, you know, uh, they will inject you with enzymes just to make profits. So... It's like a guinea pig society. That's true. So. You know, you talk about destruction of family. I mean, it's continuing even now with all the work culture and um, the kind of things we see happening in schools. And I, I don't know to what extent that's happening in India as well. I, I'm sure there are some attempts to to break down the barriers to this kind of society, which is the family, probably taking place in India as well, but hopefully with not much success. Not, uh, no, it has started in the urban mm-hmm. areas, but I think we are at a critical juncture uh, with the fiat currency fall because it started with the fiat currency. Right. So it, it will stop with that. So it's because of that fiat reserve currency, the socialist freebies was possible in the West, endless printing of euro and dollar, that you are getting the socialist benefits where the state takes the role of husband, sometimes of a father, 
sometimes of a brother, sometimes of the son. So the kids are told that you can leave your parents, the state will take care of the Medicaid, right? So the state interfered in the family relations because of this endless printing of the fiat currency. Mm. So once this fiat reserve currency falls, automatically you will find adults started li- starts to live with their parents. Uh, you will see that moment. As soon as the crisis hits, you know, and the high interest regime picks up, you will find the Western uh, families, you know, gathering together because, uh, you know, you, they will eventually come down to the same Sanatan economics model where, you know, you have to take care of the parents, aged mm-hmm. parents and, and right. So both the generations and the life cycles, because the, I see this all comes from this Abrahamic economics format of one life. So if uh, the, 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 the main difference between the East and the West is the East is saying uh, that I am the soul and body is just a vehicle. The West is saying I am the body, soul is just a vehicle. So if you are a body, uh, then this is the only life you got. And if this is the only life you got, then you want to consume and spend everything and take over resources and clash around for those resources, mm-hmm. right? So this is not the wisdom which the Indian subcontinent and the dharmas have, which is exactly why you see that the Western uh, economies are always involved in war, wars and conflicts because they are looking at finite resources as mm-hmm. wealth. Whereas in Sanatan economics, nothing finite is wealth. Those with the life cycle is the only wealth that you have, right? So, which is why you don't see the concept of savings in the West. They do not believe in savings because they do not believe in life cycles. This is the only life they have. They want to spend it and enjoy. In the Indian context, it's totally the opposite. Even if, even if there are, you know, uh, artificial uh, benefits given to spend, people will still not spend. Because this Sanatan uh, life cycle wisdom is going to continue. It's a civil, it's a civilizational wisdom. It's amazing. Right. It's really amazing. Um, so where can people find out more about your book and when is it coming out? Where is it going to be? How, how do um, people get so, it? So uh, the first book which covers this uh, geopolitics entirely where you have uh, the chapter dollar of mm-hmm. war and the good old gold which covers what we just some portion of what we discussed today uh, that will be launched next month in Delhi. Okay. Uh, the second one, which, which is the Bharat model, which covers Sanatan economics exclusively mm-hmm. uh, that will be along with the G20 summit parallel to the main G20 okay. summit, much a bit before that. So that's what, okay. but you know, the fundamental difference we have to understand between why the US and the Chinese and the Russian and all the other economies are destroyed because they believe in one life. The biggest mistake they did was they used women as a unit of labor for temporary GDP during their fertile years. You imagine the kind of suicide these economies have done. Right now, all these countries are aging. They don't have the birth rates. They actually going to live only one life. They took it literally from the Abrahamic values. So they used women as a unit of labor for temporary shoring up of GDP. And now they are aging and now they are wondering. uh, They have imported radicals from the Middle East uh, to uh, to fill in the gap of the manpower supply because their own birth rates are Mm -hmm. gone. You, you imagine the chaos they are in because of this Abrahamic value of one life, which is why Sanatan economics model has to come mm-hmm. up where we have, where we have to make people understand that women cannot be used as a unit of labor for temporary GDP. Uh, she, she is destined for a greater job for the civilization, for the mm-hmm. family, for the carrying forward of the Sanatan values. For, for economics till eternity, right? Not for temporary GDP. Yeah. You have you have men for temporary GDP, <laughs> right? 
Okay. okay. So during the fertile years specifically, uh, the woman cannot be used as a unit of labor. But this all has come from the 18th century industrialization of Europe, right. where, you know, the extreme capitalism exploited uh, humans as a unit of labor. And, uh, and to be very sure, you know, every time capitalism manages to create scenarios of exploitation to the limits, and then communism is born out of it. Hmm. The same way, the same way, the debt mountain that the West has now created on itself with this endless printing of currency and capitalism is now coming up with a solution of a communist currency, CBDC. It's the same right. thing. Fascinating. So, Dr. Shah, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Um, thank you for taking us through this journey of reserve currencies, dollarization, de-dollarization. And from the way you describe things, it definitely seems that Sanatan economics, those dharmic principles, they have to be the solution that prevents complete annihilation through war, or if not war, then digital enslavement of society. So these concepts that are the DNA of dharmic civilization, which are incredibly life affirming, will all be in your book. So really recommend everybody to look out for it, um, read it, share it. And let's collectively try to get back to those Sanatani values that were so successful for Bharat only a few hundred years ago. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank Pleasure you. to have you. Jane. Namaste. Jane. And um, thank you till next time. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanyavad. Namaskar.